You know, he was slowly deteriorating as the, as the day went by. And like Eric said, you, you didn't know how bad it was until you got into the ring. And um, it was not good. Not good for wrestling, not good for the fans, um, not good for Jeff, not good for anybody. And uh, just kind of a, a shame. And uh, the rest is history on how we ended the match. The date, March 13, 2011. The event, TNA Victory Road. The main event that night was for the TNA World Heavyweight Championship between champion Sting and challenger Jeff Hardy. But this would be no ordinary matchup. It was time for the main event. Jeff Hardy's music hit, but he was nowhere to be seen. It took over 40 seconds for the charismatic Enigma to show up. And when he did, he didn't look good. Fans in attendance and commentators alike could tell that something was up with Hardy. He was in no shape to compete that night and what we ended up getting was Sting pinning Hardy for real forcibly, getting the three count and ending the match very quickly. So what really happened that night? Well, Bruce Pritchard, who was working for TNA at the time, stated that at 7 o'clock that night, Jeff Hardy looked fine. However, between then and just before the match started, Jeff Hardy's condition would deteriorate substantially. Pritchard stated that just before the match begun, Hardy was seen being helped by two TNA wrestlers backstage. With Hardy's feet dragging behind him, he was being helped to the gorilla position. The gorilla position being right at the entranceway, where the wrestlers will go just before they go out to perform their entrance and their match. Pritchard stated that Jeff was out of it and was under the influence of something, and that he was in no condition to go out there and wrestle. People who were around Jeff Hardy at that time didn't think he was even capable of going out there and going down the entrance way. But Hardy had other ideas, and by his own accord, he made his way down the aisle. So Hardy was out there, in front of a live crowd. Backstage, the TNA crew, including Eric Bischoff and Bruce Pritchard, knew that he couldn't compete and something had to be done. Sting, Hardy's opponent, was told about what was going on at this time and he was seething. Quote Bruce Pritchard, on a scale of 1 to 10 on being angry, he was at a 108. With Hardy already out in the ring at this point, Sting was told backstage by Bischoff and Pritchard, you just need to go out there and beat him. Jeff was in no condition to compete and it was unsafe for Hardy and for Sting to have him in the ring in that condition. It was an awkward position because it was live <clears throat> and we knew we couldn't edit it. There was no way to fix it. Um, it was pretty apparent when Jeff made his way out to the ring that he was a wreck. We didn't really realize how badly wrecked he was until he got to the ring. And then it was a question of what do we do? World heavyweight champion Sting makes his entrance. And he knows in his mind at this point that he's got to end this one quick. And you'll notice the referee making a cross signal with his arms. That is an indication, a signal to the backstage area that something is not right out there. With both men now in the ring and Jeff Hardy still visibly out of it and Sting visibly frustrated, this is where Eric Bischoff comes out and tries to sort things out on the spot. And to be really honest, um, the two things I thought of, because I was a character in TNA and I was kind of like the abusive boss, you know, it would have been okay for my character as the boss to go out and do something drastic. And the thought went through my mind to just go out and knock him out, for real. And that's not tough guy talking, because number one, I'm not. And number two, a six-year-old kid could have knocked him out at that moment. So it was just a creative way of just putting an end to it and going off the air and then figuring out what to do with it after the fact creatively. Um, but I just couldn't get myself to do that. Um, but it went through my mind about halfway through the ring. It was, you know, I was debating it. Uh, and it was a sheer disappointment. And to be honest, disgust. I was really disgusted, A, with myself, because he walked right by me and I could have stopped it, and I didn't. 
and I was angry at myself. I was probably as angry at myself as I was at him. No, that's not true, but it was close. The crowd didn't really know what was going on at this point. Bischoff said he came out to make it a no disqualification match, but in reality, he was telling Jeff Hardy, hey, we're going to end this one quick. Sting's going over. That was the real reason Bischoff was out there. It had nothing to do with a no disqualification match. However, with Hardy being so out of it, it is doubtful that what Bischoff told him even registered. Sting decked Bischoff to make the whole thing seem plausible, and the match got underway. But you could hardly call this a match at all. From bell to bell, this thing was only around 90 seconds in length, with most of that time being Jeff Hardy deciding whether or not to throw his shirt into the crowd. The two competitors locked up, there was a kick, a couple of punches by Sting, a death drop, and that was it. It was all over. But this was a real pin, guys. Sting had to really keep Jeff Hardy down. As you can see here, Hardy is trying to kick out for real. It appeared that what Bischoff had told him earlier about going down in this match had not even registered with him. He was just so out of it, he didn't really know what was going on, and he shouldn't have been out there. It was a real danger to him and Sting. So in the end, they had to end the match really quick, and they did that. With the match now over and Sting walking back up the entranceway with his title in hand, the crowd were chanting bulls to what they had just seen. To which Sting responded, I agree. Pritchard said that the whole incident was such a shock they just wanted to get the heck out of there as quick as they could. So there was no thought of putting on a replacement match or a replacement opponent or anything like that. Jeff Hardy fled the scene immediately and was not seen or heard from for weeks after the incident. Eventually Jeff was contacted and he was told he had to go into drug rehabilitation and alcohol treatment for his problems, which he did, and he got himself clean and sober. After Jeff's suspension from TNA and after he got himself clean, he came back to the TNA locker room. He apologized for what had happened and that apology was accepted. Jeff Hardy stated on the Colt Cabana podcast that he went back and he watched the match. It was one of the hardest things he had to do, but it really gave him an epiphany. Really made him open his eyes as to what was going on in his life. He was grateful to Sting for being so professional and ending the match quickly and that it was definitely the right thing to do. Jeff Hardy stated that he had a lot of challenges in his life in 2011, coupling that with a lot of time on the road. He just got carried away in addiction. Hardy would rebound to have a successful 2012 in TNA and would eventually go on with his brother Matt to re-sign with the WWE in 2017. However, as recent as of 2019, Jeff Hardy would have another couple of incidents. One for public intoxication and one where Hardy was arrested and charged with driving while impaired. But since then, Jeff seems to be on the road to redemption and we wish him all the best. A very talented professional wrestler, no doubt about it. Um, but since that time, you know, Jeff Hardy is one of the guys who I have some of the most respect for in the industry. Because he owned it, he turned his life around, he became a better human being because of it. And I think in many in many ways, I respect Jeff as much or more than I respect anybody because of that very incident. Woo! Thanks heaps guys for tuning into the video. Be sure to drop a scorpion death drop on that like button and subscribe to the channel for more awesome pro wrestling action from the WWE, the WCW and much more.